Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I'm here with... Ron Lundeen. I am a development manager at Paizo, and uh, I handle a lot of the uh, adventure paths we do. Excellent. Yes, and today we're going to talk about Abomination Vaults. Yes. Um, <laughs> I This is only the first part of it, and wow, I uh, it's an amazing book. Um, I, I get worried sometimes about Mega Dungeons because... Uh, I, I've done I've done Temple many times. I've done um, oh the uh, um, Under Mountain a few times, mm -hmm. and it's it's always a difficult thing to do uh, to put together. Sometimes if modules don't have, they worry so much about well, what the, all the different ones may have that sometimes forget about story, or 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 even keeping the interest of players. I, I find that the most challenging thing. Uh, but before we get to the details, okay. um, let's just clear things out. I've noticed that a lot of content creators have freaked out a bit, and I just want to address it because I don't want to see comments about it really. It's, just, it's a very silly thing to talk about. But uh, when Paizo released a statement saying that Abomination Vaults will be converted to fifth edition, well, there'll be a fifth edition version of it. People thought, what's wrong with Paizo? Is Paizo business is okay? Are they, or is, is everything falling apart? Would you like to quickly address that? Yes, yes, we're we're fine. Uh, first of all, Paizo is is fine, doing well. Our second edition of the game is going very strong. We're very happy with it, very proud of it. Um, doing a single fifth edition product, it's the only one we have on our schedule. The only, I, the, you know, the only one that we've got is is sort of some good sense to try to figure out how to get our game into other game systems. Uh, you know, we work closely with a lot of other partners. There's the the Rise of the Rune Lords campaign for Savage Worlds that came out. This is this is some exploration in other game systems, and it's and it's nothing more or less than that. We're not trying to position ourselves well for Wizards of the Coast to buy us out, or frankly, for Wizards of the Coast to notice us. Um, we, you know, we just think this is another great way where people can experience the story exactly as you said. It's it's a great story inside of a dungeon crawl and we want to have a lot of other people as many people as we can pay attention to kind of the cool stories that we can tell and the cool world we have them in mm -hmm. uh that's what that's what this is all about it's uh it's not doom and gloom uh i didn't help things any uh i had a, a podcast i was on that was coming out on april 1st where i talked a lot about how yep Starfinder 5th edition and Pathfinder 5th edition and we're going to set all of our old products on fire and I, I, I just increasingly ridiculous to let people know that it was just a uh, part of an April Fool's prank but now that that holiday is past us we're fine <laughs> <laughs> so yes if, if you haven't heard um, Abomination Vaults is coming out for 5th edition also I'm surprised this wasn't um, uh, as well known this part of the news that they're Looks like they're putting it all together into one book. Before, it's just three separate um, mm -hmm. uh, venture paths. Um, yes. And now it's coming out into one book. Is that is that? Am I correct about that? Yes. And in fact, they're coming in the opposite order. The three the three individual volumes were part of the subscription of our adventure path. With a compilation into a single hardcover is coming out. I believe next month. I think it's coming out in May. Um, it's it's soon, and I'm really proud of it. And I have seen not. Virtual. I've seen only virtually our publisher hold up his copy of it, but uh, it's in the process of getting printed and we'll get it shipped, distributed. Um, what we've done with that is take all three of them pretty much as they are. We didn't do a lot of big changes or change any dungeon levels or anything like that. It's, it's substantially the same product as the three, maybe organized a little more clearly. We've got some places where, you know, we, we have people were saying, well, we, a, an image of this thing is is talked about if we can i have one to show to my players oh, okay we ordered art for that um things like that kind of you know clean it up a little bit but substantially the same between two covers and it's still pathfinder second edition rules that's soon the fifth edition version isn't coming out until i think november of this year uh right at the end of the year so that's when that'll have the full conversion it's got all the the stats in it for all the crazy new you know, Paizo monsters that we have. You've got your Shones and your Cawthuges and, you know, New Drow and all kinds of stuff that'll, all the fifth edition stats are going to be there for that all in one hardcover book. So if I may ask, I mean, uh, Pathfinder is known to having really incredible adventure paths. Um, uh, why Abomination Pulse? Why is this the first one for, to, for fifth edition? 
Great question. Couple of reasons. First, it's the second edition campaign that we compiled as a hardcover first. I mean, we, we've had a couple of second edition campaigns um, and Age of Ashes, Extinction Curse, uh, uh, the, uh, the Absalom, Agents of Edgewatch. Um, uh, those are big. They're first through 20th level. They're six volumes. Abomination Vaults was sort of a, a lighter lift. It only takes characters first through 10th level still a big campaign, but it's only half the length. So that one was a little easier to put together into a compilation. It's also a little more standalone. If you're doing Age of Ashes, you're getting a great tour of our whole world, the whole Inner Sea region, a lot of different areas. Extinction Curse dives really deeply into the lore of uh, Aridin, the dead god, and uh, the island in the middle of our, kind of our version of the Mediterranean. And then Agents of Edgewatch is all, all takes place within just a massive metropolis. And so learning a lot about that city is an important background. Abomination Vaults is kind of its own standalone thing. It fits into our world. It actually is near that big metropolis, uh, but it's got a little town nearby and it's got the depths of the dungeon itself, but it's otherwise very standalone. I, I heard even very early on, a lot of people say, oh, hey, this is the kind of thing I can just drop into my own game world, right? I just need a little town on a coast and a creepy lighthouse further inland and there I'm ready to go. Uh, the fact that it was so standalone is not only the big reason that we ch chose it to compile uh, into one Pathfinder second edition book, but that made it a great opportunity to, to convert it to fifth edition as well. Uh, we like that it's set in our world. We think that the storytelling we do is really strong but we, you, there's not going to be quite as heavy a lift in order to kind of understand the world that it's set in and where the NPCs have come from and why and how they play into their own home nations and so on. This is a very more focused product. And so that made it a good choice for this. Uh, one of the special things about Pathfinder is the, the setting of Galarian. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I, I would even boldly say that I think it gets favor on a run for, a run for its money. Uh, when it comes to the, the level of, of incredible settings and, and adventure scenes available. Um, would that change with going to 5th edition? Galar is, was this to be Galarian in 5th edition? It is. It's going to be Galarian in 5th edition. And where there are, where there's a maybe a different connection to 5th edition, sometimes we'll say it, sometimes we won't, right? We, we One of the key NPCs in the little town is a follower of Serenre, a goddess of the sun and light and healing. Uh, all right, well, whatever good deity of sun and light and healing you've got in your world, you know, maybe it's Lathander, maybe it's somebody else. But for the purpose of our adventure, we're going to call it Serenre. That's that's our, that's the god in Galarian. Uh, and so that's, so sometimes we just say this is what it is, and we don't give a, uh, a connection. Sometimes we've got to be a little, a little more, um, a little more nuanced. The language that evil monsters that lurk in the under the earth and in the deepest ocean trenches in fifth edition is called deep speech in, in Galarian it's called Aklo. And so the first time we mention it, we're like, this creature speaks Aklo parentheses, a variation of deep speech. So that way a fifth edition player is going to go, ah, and not only do I know what that is, I now know the word that can be carried through throughout the rest of that. I'll know what Aklo is, right? So um, so we make the little connections that exist in the game, but we keep do so keeping it in our game world. There are some uh, game masters that have played both Pathfinder and D&D, &D, and, and I, I saw some um, uh, comments from players that they're excited that their game master can bring this to 5th edition now so that they could mm -hmm. kind of entice players to like maybe get a peek of what Pathfinder really has to offer. So for anyone that's, that maybe ran Abomination Vaults, and Pathfinder, and now is looking to do that for fifth edition. What changes should they be aware of? Well, there are some there are some system changes, and I have to give a lot of uh, a lot of credit and a shout out to David N. Ross. He's a, uh, a freelancer I work with in order to do this conversion. And there's a lot more to making an adventure path converted from Pathfinder 2nd edition to 5th edition than just, oh, you use different goblin stats, use these goblin stats instead, right? There's some, there's some structural design issues that we had to address. Uh, the, the prevalence of magic items as treasure is one thing. The fact that you sort of speed through in 5th edition, you speed through 1st and 2nd level 
really fast. I mean, it, sometimes you first level can go by in the course of an evening of play, and then you kind of get into second level and so on. Uh, we kept that in mind. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, for example, the upper level of the dungeon is just super populated with enough things to give you enough XP to go to second level. Well, that's true in 5th Edition, but that means there are actually fewer enemies. And so this room that used to contain Monster X in Pathfinder, oh, now it contains the corpse of Monster X that died of starvation because the stupid creatures trying to keep it alive failed in their job, right? That's, uh, you know, so it's, the story kind of fits the same, but we've done some of the uh, the work in the underlying rules in order to to make the game flow the way a fifth edition GM is going to expect the game to flow. Uh, will the artwork change a lot between books? Uh, no, virtually none. Uh, that is to say, the fifth edition has they might have their their drow might be slightly visually different than than the Paizo's drow. But we're giving you the art for Paizo's Drow. That's part part of the things that we want to do to show people, hey, look, our world has got, in a lot of cases, its own look. It's got its own uh, 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 themes. And you'll be able to see the art. The art's going to be the same. I I don't... I'm trying to think if I ordered... If I ordered any new art for the fifth edition, it was less than five pieces of art. It's mm -hmm. A lot of it is just the same carried over. A lot of it, frankly, is art that we've already got in our game that we might not have used in um, the Abomination Vaults compilation, but that we could use in the 5th edition version. For example, uh, if you've got a, a, a Grothlet Flesh Warp, in Pathfinder 2nd edition, you just opened a flesh warp and show your people in the bestiary and you show your players the picture. Ew, it's this gross thing. Ew. Well, fifth edition players don't have any idea what that is. The words grothlet flesh warp don't mean anything to them. So we put the bestiary picture in there in order to show, oh, this is what this monster looks like. And there are a few places where we did that to kind of help fifth edition GMs, or are fifth edition DMs, excuse me, uh, who don't have our bestiary to fall back on to still be able to communicate to their players. Here's what this is and what it looks like and so on. I, I know with, with Paizo, they tend to have like map tiles or pawns uh, mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with, with either different uh, adventure paths or, or setting books. Um, is there anything like that coming out for, for this book, for the fifth edition book? For the fifth edition? Uh, no. Although a number of the things that you could use for the second edition would still work. We do have pawns. We have the Abomination Adventure Path pawns. And so if you want to know, oh, here's the, here's the array of critters we're using. It might not exactly match up. If we've given you four gremlins in the Pathfinder second edition version, because there's a fight with four gremlins. And in the fifth edition version, there's only two gremlins. All right, we've got too, too many. All right, all right, but it's still the same monsters. Because we tried to translate over the same creatures, same types of, of monsters, you'll be able to get those with the uh, with the Pathfinder version of the pawns, because those are sort of rules agnostic. Um, one of the things that we're doing is, for the, the, comp, the second edition compilation, is a series of battle cards that we do with some of our bestiaries. It's got a picture of the monster on one side, and then the Pathfinder 2nd Edition stats on the backside. That's the kind of thing that even 5th Edition DMs will get 50% use out of, right? They, here's a card to show the players, this is what this particular, you know, Morlock champion looks like, or, or you know, you know, you want to know what an Erdefin is. They look like this. They're gross blue, blue skin vampire people. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of the things that we have that we'll be able to carry over um, and I don't think that we have, I, I, well, I frankly don't know that we've yet settled on what types of accessories we might have to supplement the fifth edition Abomination Vaults. Like I say, that's, that's right at the end of this year. So we've got some time. We tend to put together uh, the larger rule books, adventure path thing before we start settling out specific you know, ma maps and map tiles or, or pawns or battle cards and things like that. Those, those tend to come a little bit later. I think that there's probably some, some room for that. Room for that. I think there's a good argument for it because we've seen so much positive feedback about the existence of the, the Abomination Vaults 5th edition that, you know, heck, well, you know, why not put those things together that are specifically intended for 
fifth edition DMs to use this this campaign book with. Hmm. Uh, I know that um, there's a free player's guide you can download if you're mm -hmm. playing on the second edition Pathfinder version of uh, Abomination Bolts. Mm -hmm. Will there be is there something like that come um, available that will be available for the fifth edition version? Uh, no, but no, <laughs> no, and yes. Let me explain. Um, there is the the player's guide that is for the three separate volumes is super helpful for you to be able to get to play those three volumes. That might not be something, even though it's it's electronic, it's a PDF that you can go get. What we intentionally folded a lot of that kind of stuff into the Pathfinder second edition hardcover. For example, we've got the backgrounds that you could get are in the, the Pathfinder second edition hardcover. Uh, so you don't have to go to the new file. You're building a connection to the, the area is something that's within the covers of the hardcover. Uh, we kept some of that. So even though fifth edition doesn't have backgrounds, what we've done is we made sure to foreground, this is the town, here are the key people in it. And you might wanna have your players have uh, attachments to these people in order to enrich their, uh, their stake in the campaign. Uh, and that's going to be true regardless within the covers of the fifth edition book that we're doing. Hmm. For those that are new and might be hearing about Abomination Vaults for the first time, uh, especially uh, those that played uh, D&D and now uh, is hearing about uh, this news, um, what would you say, how would you describe the, the story behind it? This is a uh, this is uh, this is this is a mega dungeon. That's the uh, that's the key selling point, and I mean that in all of the ways that you might be thinking mega dungeon positively, right? If you are the kind of people I'm getting together with my friends, and look, we don't want to do a lot of you know role playing. We don't want to do a lot of frankly necessarily a whole lot of big deep plotting. We just want to kick down doors and kill monsters on the other side, get their treasure, and then go kick down another door. Yep. This adventure works fine in that way. But if but if you also are looking for, look, I want my character to be invested. I want to have the things that I do in this dungeon matter to people that my character cares about. We've built in an awful lot of that. The sort of the default way of running Abomination Vaults is with connections to the town and with care to the people in the town. Um, the... The story itself at a very high level to try to, I mean, sort of the elevator pitch. If somebody's like, hey, we're thinking about running a fifth edition campaign. I'm like, oh, you ought to try Abomination Vaults. And they say, why? I say, oh, it <laughs> is a uh, <laughs> it is it is a mega dungeon, kind of in the theme of Temple of Elemental Evil with a little town of Hamlet nearby. This is one that's got a little town that you're tied to, that you're a part of. There's this creepy old lighthouse above a bunch of ruins in the swamp about half an hour away. And some of the really sort of keen-sighted people in town have pointed out, hey, that lighthouse is now starting to glow. And it never has in the 500 years it's been there. That's probably bad. Can you please go check it out? And they might even tell you there was an evil sorceress who was killed there by a group of heroes 500 years ago. And it is probably not much difficult. It's probably not difficult for you to look at the art on the cover of the adventure path and say, oh, the, hey, there's this angry ghost woman right on the cover. All right, you can put two and two together there and find out that this uh, this uh, defeated sorceress from hundreds of years ago is back. The dungeons that she created are far more extensive than anybody in town realizes, although the players will learn. And they're, and they're stocked with all kinds of dangers that the town doesn't realize, but the heroes are soon gonna have to stop. And as with any mega dungeon campaign, you know, you start, you can start out making quick runs to and from the town and the, the, the trouble is not particularly difficult, but the deeper you go, not only is it greater danger, greater rewards, but you'll also find this whole ecosystem of creatures who kind of had to get along in the dark or not get along in the dark. Some of them descendants of original creatures that were there. Uh, really long lived ones are actually the ones that were there for hundreds of years. And what have they done since? And so it's a mega dungeon with a lot of thought put into it and a lot of thought put into how do the adventures address this? Why do they care? 
What are the stories of the creatures that are living in this dungeon? And ultimately, how do we put a stop to this rising threat of evil? Hmm. Does that do it? Does that make you want to play the Abomination Vaults now? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Although, although <laughs> to be fair, I, I, I peaked, I peaked ahead of time. So, I, 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 when I read, when I read the, um, the story behind it and what was going on, I, I really like that. It's very, it's in a way, it's very classic, but, but in a way, also, it, it feels, it doesn't feel like um, something I've, I've ran before. Um, you know, it, it, it. So, not to diss the old modules. You know, I, I enjoy running them. Um, but I have to do a lot of, I don't know if homework's the right word. I, I, have to, I have to read ahead and then I have to piece the story together because I think when modules were made, they weren't thinking too much about plot. It was just there. And there's a lot of, uh, like if you play Temple of Elemental Evil, there's, there's instances in there that sort of has nothing to do with the main quest whatsoever. It's just a lot of weird, random things. Um, but this feels concise. This feels organized. Nothing feels wasted. It, it, it even um yeah you kick down doors and everything but it, it all ties in to the major story in some ways now not some really random tangent that never gets uh uh, uh, uh like, like the story wise doesn't get fulfilled in any way it's just you know um as much as i like random encounters i sometimes i do need a story to drive my characters mm -hmm. um so that's why I, I i enjoy this module very much um at least so far i only got part one so i'm, I'm looking forward to two and three and i'm hopefully left continue to run it before the end of the year um yep. i'm sorry I, i'm sidetracking <laughs> no 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 that's okay that's okay um what and what you're seeing if you've looked at the first one what you're seeing is that the upper parts of the dungeon have in many ways a really close connection to the town we're expecting on like levels one through four you're going to come come running to and from the town quite a lot uh and then even at the beginning of the second volume right you're going to be spending some time in town to deal with some issues that are going in the town but then when you go back into the dungeon over the course of the next several levels the expectation is you go back to the town less because you're finding allied groups that you can hang out with your the tension between maybe townsperson a and dungeon denizen b instead becomes tension between dungeon denizen c and dungeon denizen d and what are you going to do about that so there's still people to get to know there's still people to, to help. I mean, you're here. We're, we refer to the player characters as heroes throughout this because you're the good people doing good things. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, there's still people to rescue. How did they get there? Uh, what does it mean that they were brought there? That's all sort of mysteries that you get to solve. We have side quests that run all the way through this thing set aside in uh, uh, individual rooms or people that you talk to. They're like, you know, oh, you know, hey, I got Head of the Thieves Guild had some smugglers go missing. If you find what happened to the smugglers, please let me know. And you can almost hear the the quest log ting <laughs> as you keep getting more and more things into it. But yeah, the the intent is that there's always something that's continuing to sort of drive you forward and explore further, explore deeper, and so on. So that's that's that narrative pull into the dungeon is exactly the kind of thing that people who want more than just, I kick down the door and I fight whatever's next to keep them going in the story all the way through. Okay. One final question. Okay. If I was running this and you were playing with me, who would you be? Oh man. Um, gosh, I, gosh, I sure love playing halflings. Uh, so I would be, a halfling, probably a halfling wizard or sorcerer. And here's why. One of the things that we picked up real early on is the, the themes of ghosts and haunts. And I don't want to get too detailed about it, but that's a heavy theme. And one of the pieces of art that we have is a halfling sort of ghost hunter. And I'm like, oh, that as soon as I saw that piece of art, I'm like, I want to play that character. If I could play in this game, I'd play that character. I'd be a halfling ghost hunter. So connect that with something sort of scholarly. Um, I pick wizard because I kind of know some of the things that are good for wizards as you go through the campaign. I'm already a terrible player at this because of my, <laughs> my out of game knowledge, but uh, that's what I do. Hmm. You know, so, okay. So I lied. I do have one more question. Um, okay. No, keep them coming. <laughs> There's always one more level of questions and is like the dungeon. <laughs> so anyone that has played either fifth edition or the play uh, Pathfinder version, and they're looking for something else to play afterwards, now that they've gotten a taste of what 
uh, Paizo offers. They want to mm-hmm. see some, something else. What would you recommend them to check out? Well, we've got two, two things. If you are, you mean, if you're a Pathfinder 2nd Edition player and you finish up Abomination Vault, you're like, I love these characters. What do I want to do with it? This was our first three-part adventure path, and we were a little bit intentional about it in that it is immediately followed by our second three-part adventure path, Fists of the Ruby Phoenix, about an international martial arts tournament that requires you start at the level you just finished up Abomination Vaults with, uh, and that'll take you level 11 through a level level 20. So if you finish up Abomination Vaults in Pathfinder 2nd Edition and you feel like, I want to keep playing, I want to keep playing the same characters, oh boy, you can roll right into this next adventure path. If you're a 5th edition player and you say to yourself, all right, well, I've got this, I've just played the path, the 5th edition version of the Abomination Vaults adventure path, and I want to see what else Paizo has to offer. The easiest way for you to do that is to pick up our beginner box or the Troubles in Otari adventures. Those two things are set in the same town with the same people you've gotten to know in 5th edition, you're just coming at it playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition characters. So you'll be like, oh, I remember Morlebin the bookseller, right? So now my, uh, you know, my catfolk champion, instead of, uh, you know, to be a path with a Pathfinder type of character rather than a 5e kind of character, can kind of get into that. But once you've sort of thought, all right, well, this is the move that we want to make. We want to see what awesome things Paizo does for us if we're committed to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Well, oh boy, have we got no end to stories for that. I mean, you want to you want to join a circus, we've got Extinction Curse. If you want to have adventures at a magic school, the oldest magic school in our world, we've got Strength of Thousands. Uh, you want to pick up Guns and Gears, we've just uh, started to come out with the Outlaws of Alkenstar Adventure Path, which is so steampunk and uh, Wild West. That we have a lot of different exciting themes, and we have a lot of different ways that people can get into that. So uh, we've got, there are plenty of places to go. Sit down with your group. Say, all right, we really want to give this Pathfinder 2nd Edition a try. We want to see what Galarian has to offer. What kind of stories do you want to tell? We've got stories for it. All right, excellent. So again, um, Abomination Vaults, um, the uh, collected hardcover edition will be out in May, and the 5th edition version will come out later this year. Right, right. So, uh, uh, viewers, uh, thank you for watching. Um, stay safe out there, and uh, stay tuned for more uh, Pathfinder uh, nuggets of news. Um, take care, everyone.